committee overwhelmingly rejected that. That got killed in testimony by people who run online systems, who said, here's the thing. You get an advantage with going online. You attract new people into voting. You make voting easier because you do it on your phone or at your computer. That's the benefit. You get an uptick. The risk is it is never secure. And you and one uh, the IT experts out of IBM in the States said, if you're hacked, you won't even know it. Maybe forever, but certainly not immediately. You'll know a couple of years down the line. You'll find the trail. And now you've had a government for two years, which is not a government. The NDP knew they got hacked right away at the last leadership. Uh... You can, and, and then it, it really put an interest. We had a leadership race where the system crashed. That was a, that was a party leadership race. Imagine that in a general election. So we went, we struggled with these things because there's pros and cons with every choice. Voting age, I was an enthusiast for it. Some others were not. We left it at 18. We said we didn't recommend to lower it. That was 16. Some, often it was a 50-50 question that one. Some people like it. Some people. But we also recommended referendum, which was a bottom line for both the uh, conservatives and the bloc. Bottom line, this is a requirement. A, a small sort of tangent about referenda. Incredibly powerful and need to be respected. Canada's only had a couple of them in our history at the national level. They're very rare. They often ask a question, but voters answer a different question. <laughs> right? Whether they like the government or not. The questions can be manipulated very easily. We've seen this through Quebec referendum, where if you want to, if you intuitively say yes, the question is worded in such a way that you have to say no, and you can lie a lot and mislead voters. We saw that in the last Ontario referendum, where all sorts of myths and uh, alternative facts were spread about changing the voting system, and voters believed it. To the point where we had exit polls in Ontario that 70% of the people who went and voted wanted every vote to count, wanted proportional. And of those people, only 40% actually voted for the reform because they'd been told it was going to do the opposite by the Toronto Sun. So these things happen. Yet, referendum, a referendum is inherently democratic. It's hard to say it's not a democratic process. And it also brings in the notion that voters get the final say, not politicians. The counter-argument is that we voted in the last election. 64% of the parliament is made up of MPs who campaigned on changing the voting system. Is that not enough of a mandate? And I and other arguments. If, if I were to try to find a middle ground on this polar debate, I would suggest uh, bring a new system in and then have a confirmation referendum to one or two elections down the road. You get over the fear of the unknown, which is a big thing that voters were, I don't understand. I understand this new voting system, it's crazy. I don't know what it means, so I'm going to reject it. Oh, I've seen it. Oh, I like it, or I don't. But the power ultimately would rest with voters, no matter what. Question. Could the word referendum be structured in an alternative system that is being tested then? Uh, could it be? I don't know what's the question. What do you mean? Like, have it uh, more uh, a proportional one where oh, yes. something it, it uh, tests a different system than for because referendum are generally yes, first no. past the post. Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah, uh, uh, Prince Edward Island just had a referendum that had actually a ranked ballot in it. So they had five voting options, status quo, mixed member, report. they had a bunch, and you ranked them, and then they counted it that way, and actually mixed member proportional, MMP won. And the Premier got up the next day and said, not enough people voted, it's not valid. <laughs> <laughs> This is the challenge about electoral reform. There's an inherent, and, and Aaron mentioned it, is that you require an instance in which the party, or parties, who just got elected under the old system, forego the old system that worked for them to get to a better system. It speaks against self-interest. And when Trudeau made his promise first, he spoke to that. He said, for 150 years, first past the post has worked for us. But it's not working for Canadians. That's why I'm making this commitment. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's kind of like enlightened leadership. Yes, sir. But at that point, he probably thought first past the post wasn't going to benefit him as much as it did. Right, because he was in third at the time. Yeah. yeah, well, there's that. They've been out of power for a number of years. I, throughout all this whole exercise, I've hesitated in speaking to intention, because I don't know his heart. I just know the words and what was repeated. And I'm not naive, and I don't think I'm stupid. 
But when, when a politician gets up and makes that promise over and over and over again, and it's clear, it's not caveat, it's not like only if and only when and maybe no, it was clear, it was black and white. Because if you break that kind of promise, now you're not speaking to the issue anymore, you're actually speaking to integrity. Whether I can trust you or not. Will you bring the lawnmower back tonight? Yes, I will. Awesome. And it's not back. Oh, okay. But this is bigger than a lawnmower. This is pretty significant. So, um, they have a cabinet shuffle. They get rid of Miriam Monsef, sorry. They promote her to the status of women and they bring in a new. I kind of dislike that, actually. Like, the minister did not perform well. And it was kind of quote unquote fired. And then you get fired to status of women. What does that say about the status of women job? I think that one should be, anyways, it's not a personal thing. Uh, a new minister comes in, also a young woman, uh, new politics, 29 years old, coming out of uh, Burlington, Ontario. Uh, Karina Gould is her name. Very nice, very smart, went to Oxford. And, and so she gets put in, and uh, we meet. She asks for a meeting with me and, and the conservative, and phones Fairboat, and Eaton Howe, and says, What do you want to do about the future? What do you want to do next? And I said, Well, <coughs> Electoral reform. <laughs> Is this a trick question? I don't understand. I want to do this. And oh, okay, well, how and what do you think? That was on Monday night. I'm out for a job Tuesday morning, running around Ottawa. My phone was crazy. You got to get to the Hill. There's a press conference. They're about to break the promise. And I said, no, they're not. I just met with her last night. As a colleague, we talked. She would be weird and kind of gross. You better get up here. Hold huh? the tie on, run up the Hill, and there it is. It has a new mandate letter from on high. This mandate letter comes down and says, we're not doing it anymore. Where do mandates come from, by the way? The people. <laughs> people. They don't come from the Prime Minister's office, people. They come from people, people. Politics is relatively simple. Campaign, you got a platform? These are my list of promises, you win? That's your mandate. You want to change that? You better have a really good reason. Yes, sir. Well, um, since you said mandate, mandate comes from the people, but my first quick question is, why did Trudeau do 180 degrees, apart from his babbling and childish smiles? And I had, like that? He did 180, that, that's a critical decision. Yeah. That's a neat step, why? Yeah, the, the, the evidence as it was did not bear it out. We had a broad consensus about where to go if you're going to go. We could, when we could debate how you confirm it, referenda, not referenda, like that's all on the table. But at no point through this entire process was I ever able to achieve a conversation with the government to say, what do you want? What do you want? I would ask, and they'd say, well, we want to consult. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Here's the evidence. Here's, the, here's what we know. So with this evidence, what do you want? Well, we want to consult. And I'm like, ah, yeah. Never got to the point of saying, well, what system? Yeah. So, you asked about the 180 degree thing. The Prime Minister was asked about it in the days that followed. And he said, he said a couple different things, and I'll, and I'll come back to you in just a second. Okay. He, oh, the promise was also made on Twitter, right? so I know it to be true. <laughs> oh, this is, an, this is an important quote. This, this came out of a December Toronto Star editorial board meeting. He said the following, Prime Prime Minister of Canada said, I make promises because I believe in them. I've heard Canadians want a better voting system of governance, a better system of governance, a better a system for choosing our governments. Canadians elect governments to do hard things and don't expect us to throw up our hands when things are a little difficult. No, I'm sorry, that's not the way I was raised. That's strong, that's, that's like laying some credibility down the tracks, right? We're doing this, Canadians expect this, Canadians want that. And this is who I am as a person. Again, I'm not that naive, but when I hear the Prime Minister of Canada get up and say that, to our largest national newspaper. I say, okay, I guess that's what's gonna happen. And I was wrong, because that was December, and they, they changed in January. And a whole bunch of blowback happened. Uh, because I thought uh, the Prime Minister, Trudeau, the Liberals, uh, executed a campaign that was very effective in speaking to what people were hoping for. Coming out of 10 years of the Harper government, there was a lack of consultation, Progressives were feeling shut out. It was that 75% of the electorate that they didn't necessarily need on a whole bunch of issues. First Nations, women, environment, you know, you go down the list. And Trudeau's campaign was very effective in terms of showing contrast and showing hopefulness. Hope and hard work, that was the, the tech. 
This, and, and so when asked in the days that followed, why did you break the promise? The Prime Minister had some interesting different options. They were sort of a moving target today. At one point, he said, uh, global uncertainty. We can't change the voting system because of global uncertainty. Which is code for Trump and, and Europe, sort of. Even though the judge under a PR system just rejected the alt right. He also said, uh, well, if we changed to a different system, Kelly Leach would have her own party. Kelly Leach is a candidate for the conservative leadership this weekend. Kelly Leach does have her own party. She's trying to lead it. <laughs> he said uh, there was no broad consensus, and this is what you'll get if you write a Liberal MP right now. Why did you not do this? There was no broad consensus. Well, 90% of the experts, 88% of the people who testified, four out of the five parties in Parliament, what exactly is a broad consensus? I don't understand. 63% of us sitting in the House of Commons made the promise. What, it, what do you mean? And he said this, and I thought this was very important, that's why I put it in big letters. He said, this was my choice to make, and I chose to make it. Strong. Right? Strong. And wrong. It's not a choice to make. It's not the system we have. Who makes the choice? People. <coughs> Expressed how? How True. do people express their choice? MPs. In a representative democracy. We call it parliament. Parliament is Not the prime minister. Yes. Well, that was the <coughs> second part of my question. You said the mandate. When that tour came through here, I was down there at the trading depot, or CMP trading depot, and had it. Aaron was there, and a few others in this room. Here, here's my point, you know, and how you get hold of it, I don't know. Um, I related an experience when I was in the Highlands of Scotland during a, a UK election. Right. Was, Storm away in the Elder Hebrides visiting ancestors, right? So they said, do you want to go to a political meeting? I said, sure. A Scottish, Scottish political meeting? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so all, see that all, all the candidates were there. Yeah. So here's the difference between them and us, especially today. It's lethargic now. And what you do about I don't know. Those, the citizens were rigorous, and it was allowed. They were rig rigorous in challenging the candidates to be elected. Right. And that was that was a, a contrast process. that you saw. Yeah. And so there was an accountability yes. of the elected MP to their constituency. Yes. It's gone the other way now. So As lethargy and you know so let's, people let's, don't see okay. many don't see getting anything out of it. But so let's 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 extend back from that as to why. Sorry? Let's go back from that's the that's the, the, the symptom you described. Yeah. Let's talk about the source. But the power of the MPs have become greater and greater. I disagree. And proportional <laughs> I totally disagree. The power of the MPs has become greater and greater. Wait. You have the parliament. The level of the citizens has dropped. That's that I agree with. Yeah. Okay, so but that could be turned around. It can. Manitoba, after their last election, went and did a survey, 40% of people didn't vote. And they went and surveyed those people. Why didn't you vote? Timing, information, what, what was it? Overwhelming, overwhelming in the Manitoba elections report was, my vote doesn't count. I live in a riding that votes this way. I vote that way. I have voted that way 10, 15, 20 times. It is actually, voting is an irrational act. We don't go into the voting booth normally thinking, this is the one. <laughs> Except if you're in Courtney Comox in British Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> this is the vote that's going to make the government. Or even this is the vote that's going to absolutely put a candidate or another over the top. We know it's a collective effort just by the inherency of it. But we have also learned through experience, either voting for somebody who won, or often voting for, and many times voting in a way that, I want to vote this way. And we're so often told, you can't vote the way you want. You have to vote strategically. Every party has, has tried this argument. Liberals are pros at it. The NDP try it from time to time. The Conservatives do that as well. The scary this and the scary that. We know who you want to vote for. Sorry. But you have to vote this way. It's a very unsatisfying experience. The reason I challenged you on the MPs having more and more power. Trudeau gave a great interview to Mansbridge just at the very end of the last election. And he talked about you know, a lot of different things. And one of them was the Prime Minister's office. 
And Justin Trudeau correctly identified that under his father's term in office, the PMO went from a correspondence office to this very powerful place. And he said, we need to change that. And I thought, well, good, you know, because you know it intimately. Well, that hasn't happened. The unelected folks under our current system wield extraordinary power. Whereas I've been through minority parliaments, and I've been through majority parliaments. I can tell you the individual power of MPs, and therefore the people they represent, goes up dramatically when power is not concentrated into the hands of the Prime Minister's office. Can I tell you a small story? Yeah. My first year, I'm six months in, we're dealing with a transport bill on ships coming into Canadian waters and dumping bilge, uh, bilge water. It's like cleaning out their, their, their tanks in the U.S. It's a $500,000 fine, and they seize your ship. In Canada, at the time, the fine was $5,000. And the Coast Guard testifies, and they show us radar maps of international ships ducking into the waters of British Columbia and Canada, to, and then going into the port in Seattle. Because even if they get caught, it's 5,000 bucks, it's nothing. And they're not gonna get caught. So we sit at a committee and say, well, that's weird. This is 2004, so let's put it in. So we make the fine $500,000, equal. And we can seize your ship. We're going up, and it's a third stage amendment report. It's kind of a last minute change. <clears throat> My phone rings as I'm walking up the hill to Parliament. I should call it, it's the Prime Minister's office. Ooh. I don't really know what that means. <laughs> we, uh, we've seen your amendment. We've seen your amendment to the bill. We'd like you to withdraw it. And they said, well, no. Who is this? Why? What? No. And they said, we don't like it. Well, I do. And I hung up. <laughs> Got into the Parliament building, so I'm now in Parliament. Not into the House of Commons yet. Phone rings again, somebody senior, more senior in the Prime Minister's office. Mr. Cullen, we're serious about this. And I was like, yeah, I heard you the first time. I don't know who you are. We want you to withdraw. No, I will not. <coughs> Get you. I had my hand on the door of Parliament, of the House Cops. Vote to go in. Vote starts in five minutes. Now we're at the top of the future. Mr. Cullen, we spoke to the Prime Minister. This is his guy. <coughs> withdraw the amendment. And I said, I don't work for you. We're going to go in and see how this goes. Thank you. I don't know, I don't know if I said that. <laughs> and we passed it. And if you dump bilge water in Canadian waters, it's going to cost you half a million dollars and we'll steal your ship. And I said uh, later to the Prime Minister, we had a moment, and I said, that's weird. And by the way, the fact that you own a major shipping line, I think puts you in a bit of a conflict of interest, Paul Martin. So next time you have your guys. But what I was watching was the exercise of power from the previous governments, which had been a majority, when the Prime Minister's office could call those things in. And they were just used to that old pattern. And I was just a rookie and experiencing this new pattern, which is MPs vote. Okay. And that's fun, by the way. <laughs> that's, that's like exciting and interesting. Okay. So if you've seen this movie before, it's because you have. <laughs> <laughs> There's new hope. There's a guy, he shows up, he's great, he's, got, he's looking into the distance in a meaningful way. He's got great hair. And he promises something new and hopeful, and it's great, and you want to get excited about it. You get excited about it. But then there's chapter two. Which in any good trilogy is the crappy one. <laughs> Her power is sort of really kind of, then there's betrayal, and you know, your friend gets frozen in carbonite and stuff, but then there's always a third chapter where the Ewoks rise up. And they say, no, 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 we, we wanted that hopey stuff from before. We expect that. And by the way, uh, someone gave me a survey last year of different um, professions in Canada by the esteemed Canadians hold for them. Where do you think politicians rank? Number one. <laughs> number one, yeah. Uh, no. This, this number one, though. <laughs> At the bottom, just in one. this survey, slightly below drug dealers. Yeah, I know. I know. Way more money in that. <laughs> Where, uh, who, uh, who, who, by the way, uh, uh, was on the top of the list? Who is the, who, what profession is the highest esteem? Firefighters. Firefighters. Right out of the gate. And who can argue with that? You know, the cat, the tree, the sacred house, the calendar. <laughs> the calendar is smart marketing. 
I suggested the calendar to some of my colleagues in the house. You know, if we want to get more popular, um, they thought it would not be helpful. Um, so we, we, there was some fun had as well. This is a comic that someone put up. Uh, this is the liberal electoral reform train, and the fact that nothing happened. It, it, it was a, it was a bit of a gong show. Right at various points, it was very hard to figure out the government strategy and very hard to dialogue with them about. And by the way, we put every option imaginable on the table. You want to go 10% proportional, 20, 30. You want to do mixed member ridings. You want to have this. You want to bring it in over three elections so gradually you won't even feel it. It's painless. We were, all of these things, referendum, order, like we just talked. We we had it all on the table. So one of the arguments the Prime Minister used in the weeks that followed was, well, he said, you know the NDP, they just won't negotiate. And I was like, oh, I almost threw my little clicker at the television at that point. And I was like, all right, Justin. Um, so here's, here's the thing. That committee report with its recommendations has uh, not been voted on. It can be voted on, and it will be voted on on May 31st, in a few short days. This is what the rules of the House of Commons say about when we get reports from committees, if we agree with them. If the reports are concurred in, concurred means voted on, and they receive a majority in the House, the recommendations become clear orders or resolutions of the House of Commons. If you say yes to a committee report, transport report, or health care, or whatever, or this, it is the expression of the will of Parliament. And I got a stack of quotes and a bunch of video of this Prime Minister saying the will of Parliament must be respected because Parliament is supreme. And the last guy I didn't, and I will. Three options can come if this were to pass. And I need 15 to 20. 20 Liberals would be safe to vote for this. They can ignore it and take another hit about ignoring Parliament now, not just a committee. They can say we will bring in the recommendations. We will seek a PR system and we will put it to a referendum. Or we can actually create that table, feeling the pressure and their MPs getting pressure at home, to say what is it that we can get done. Because the Chief Electoral Officer of Canada told us at one of our meetings, public meeting, that if Parliament sends a signal by summer, this summer, about changing the voting system, there's enough time to bring a new voting system in before the 2019 fall election. So there's a story that's been told, there's no time. There's another story that's been told, the government doesn't want to do it. The Liberals never had a vote on this. They never sat in caucus and went, okay, who wants to keep the promise, who wants to break it? They were just told. The Democratic Foreign Minister got up and said, I have a new mandate left. Not even the Prime Minister came up, which kind of ticked me off a little bit. And then the Prime Minister repeated it later. That's all that's happened. We've never voted on it. I want to, and, and Liberals from across the country wrote apology letters to their constituents. They went on Facebook and said, I'm really disappointed like you are. They, they did these things because they knew, some of them, had personally pledged on doorstep after doorstep, if you vote for me, especially that strategic vote. Were you thinking of voting green? <coughs> uh, you can vote for me, and I'll bring in electoral reform, and we can get rid of Harper. That was a, I heard that argument a lot. And for some Canadians, this was an important issue. And, and for more now, I think it becomes an issue of integrity. And so we can restore a little bit of that integrity back. We're trying to help Justin keep his promise. <laughs> this is a life, a promise-saving vision. Let's come on back in. Don't listen, to, because one of his advisors stopped me on Spark Street, which is right near the parliament, back in December. And I've known this guy for 10 years. And I like him. And he stopped me, he said, Nathan, we're not doing it. We're giving, yeah, screw it, no one cares. And we're not going to take any hits on this. And the day they broke the promise, his, his, one of his chief brains, Trudeau, saw me in the hallway and he said, you've got 24 hours worth of news, and then this thing is over. No one's going to care anymore, because it's for the nerds. It's in the weeds. It's in the weeds. Our guy is Teflon. And I said, man, that's pretty dark. And cynical. Well, let's find out. Let's find out. Don't let... The winds get to your head. Don't get the losses get to your heart. It's a dangerous thing. This happens. It's not unusual. Yes, sir. What were the views you got from the committee, the Liberal committee members? Did you get any sense of where what their position was? We were in a calibre. And uh, and we said, let's go over to the bar, because we're
we're on the road so much together. Let's go to the bar tonight after the committee hearings. Eight hours of committee hearings. Let's go get a drink. Okay. And Elizabeth shows up with a map. Elizabeth May. Love Elizabeth. And so she rolls it out on this big bar table and says, here are some voting. Here are some options. And so we all sort of gather around and, oh yeah, and the conservatives are there and we're moving riding boundaries. And we're sort of seeing how models might work because we're hearing all these models. And I noticed, I sort of stuck my head up after half an hour. And all the liberals had drifted away from the table, my five colleagues. Wow. Found something, and I thought, hmm, I don't feel very engaged. Like, this is the project. At the end of this project, we have to pick something for the country. We have to start to design something, and you're not. At the very end, we're at the 11th hour, we're writing the report. <laughs> and one of my, uh, uh, well, Elizabeth pleads, she says, to, her, to the red team. She says, okay guys, <laughs> like, it's now it. You gotta tell us what you want, what you don't want, like now is it. And one of my liberal colleagues said, I don't feel like I've learned enough. <laughs> and I just, my head thumped off the table, and I was like, okay, well, here's the thing. We've had eight months of study, seven months of study. We've spent more than half a million dollars on us getting as smart as we can about this. If you don't know enough, no one's gonna know enough. We are legislators, it is time to legislate. This is the job, but you don't want to do it. So to your question, I was never able to properly find out through all of this. They got hints of alternative vote, but it got shot down. And so then beyond that, it was impossible to, because you, like somebody, you, you say to me, um, I, uh, you want to sell me your car. And I go, great, 10 grand. And you go, mm, yeah, okay, uh, 11 or nine? And you go, well, I've got to think about that. And so I say, 15? Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> what about five? I kind of, and we're going along like this for months. You don't want to sell me your car, <laughs> right? If for months we're trying to dialogue on an issue that requires resolution, and you don't want to tell me what you want, at some point, I start to doubt your resolve. Yes, ma'am? Do you not think they want ballot? Well, the Prime Minister said later he wanted ranked ballot. But he never advocated, liberals never advocated for it, they never sort of argued for it, it they didn't write it in their report. It, it, so, what, you're trying to divine, you know what I mean? And at some point, you just gotta say it is what you want. Okay. So, here's what I'd like to do next. Um, how are we for, for uh, 20 more minutes? Yeah, we're 20 okay? Yeah. If, if, I know some folks have got other things, uh, don't feel embarrassed, because we're, we're about to do the work part. Yeah? I have a quick question. C51, yeah. the um, spilling oversight. Yeah. Is there any hope of that ever happening? Why, you got some sort of problem with the government reading your emails? <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> you don't have anything to hide, man. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you have something to hide. <laughs> we have a lot of um, So the, the committee, on a Friday afternoon of a long weekend, the government released the uh, oversight report with recommendations of what to do on C-51. The promise was not to entirely scrap it. Our promise was to scrap it. The Liberals was to modify it, to get rid of the worst parts. We're 18 months in, chop, chop. C-51 still exists in law. Yeah. The powers are extraordinary yeah. to our surveillance community and the RCMP. Extraordinary, warrantless uh, oversight. Yeah. Well, like, no judge involved. I can listen to your calls and read your emails. And that, to me, is a problem. Do you anticipate any legislation now? Yes. Yeah, no, uh, soon. They'll have to do something. Will they try to drag it all the way into the next campaign? I don't know. They might, they might risk... Because C-51, for a lot of Canadians, was a problem. Because, it, well, it's against the Charter, for example. <laughs> right? So, uh, uh, one quick thing, because there might be some of you sitting here saying, you're never going to get 20 liberal MPs to stick their heads up on this. It's not smart. <clears throat> They'll take a uh, consequence for it. We've had a number of bills now where <clears throat> the cabinet, the prime minister, has said we're voting this way. And he's had a bit of a mini revolt in the back bench. We had a genetics testing discrimination bill. Anyone know what that is? It went way below the radar. Quick and dirty story is, if uh, uh, health insurance companies were going to issue life insurance or health insurance, they could demand your genetic information before they give you insurance. Like your genes. Like we need to know, we look into your genes before we tell you about your life insurance rates. Most Western democracies, most modern democracies, well, about this. Because it's such an infringement. 
and it's genetic discrimination. Senate produced the bill. Senate produced the bill to make it illegal. Who didn't like the bill? Who really didn't like the bill? Insurance companies. And they flexed. And they lobbied. And they got the Prime Minister and his cabinet to write to all the premiers in the country, saying this is an infringement on your rights. Have the Prime Minister go up in uh, front of the House of Commons on a microphone and say, this bill is unconstitutional. It's against the Charter of Canada. It's, it's illegal. And so then they sent a little parliamentary secretary into the committee and gutted the bill. Took everything out of it. Call it up. And we worked with a good MP from Toronto, a liberal, named Rob Oliphant. And said, Rob, the evidence is overwhelming. This should be made illegal in this country. And Rob agreed. And we got some friends. And we put it all back in. Put all the good bits back into the bill. And we voted on it. And I don't know the final tally from the liberal side. 70? 80 liberal backbenchers stood against the cabinet. And we passed it to make it illegal for insurance companies to demand your genetic information before they issue you insurance. That's the law. And as it should be. That's how Parliament works, by the way. Should work. Who's the, who's the government, by the way? If you were looking at cabinet, or excuse me, if you were looking at, excuse me. Uh, so cabinet. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important note for all of our colleagues who sit on the government side but don't sit in cabinet. They're not the government. Only the cabinet's the government. Ever watch the UK question period? Some of the most devastating questions come from the government side members who are not they vicious sometimes. Better than the opposition. Because that's the job of the opposition is to hold the government to account on spending and legislation. That's our job. We've, we've fallen into this trap in Canada where uh, you get these softballs and these party line speaking points. There's a new rule, I want an old rule, very, very old rule in Parliament. You're not meant to speak um, from notes. That's what the, 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 the tradition of Parliament is you speak. You can refer to a quote or something, but you're not supposed to read speeches. It's actually an old parliamentary rule. We just don't invoke, I don't want to invoke it. I want to actually know what's on people's minds. And if you don't know the bill that's being presented, then why are you talking? <laughs> why are you speaking <laughs> if you truly don't? And I watch colleagues read their speeches for the first time before those comments. You can tell. They have no idea what's going on. I just got to get... We had a great story about a, a liberal who really likes to talk, Kevin, out of Manitoba. And he's, and he's walking into the house, just to, he's, he's supposed to be there, and, and the whip staff says, uh, can you make a speech? He says, yeah, sure. So he starts to go towards the chamber to make the speech. And he stops and he says, 10 minutes or 20 minutes? Because that's how our speeches are either 10 or 20 minutes long. And they say, we need 20. And he goes, right, good, okay. He stops again and he goes, what's the topic? <laughs> and they say, it's the transport bill. And he says, all right, 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 okay, I got it. I can do that. And he, goes, and he stops again and he says, are we for it or against it? <laughs> 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 because everybody didn't know. <laughs> It doesn't matter if you listen to the speech that day. <laughs> 20 minutes, I'm not going to get back, Kevin. Uh, so there has been a, a muscle flex. There has been an exercise in the backbench doing what their job is when the evidence requires it. And so to all those liberals that wrote the apology letters, and that's why I've been out across the country for the last six weeks, is talking to constituents in liberal practice and saying, you may have been promised, you may have voted liberal, you may not have. It doesn't really matter. But um, we invited Ralph to this. Uh, this is my 22nd or 23rd of these town halls. I haven't had a liberal show up yet. Although I've had an amazing arrangement of excuses. I got me really good. It's like, wait, what, your cat? I don't understand. There's a lot of different ways to interpret the job of member of parliament. One of them for me, one of the baseline requirements is that you show up. You gotta show up. You gotta meet your people. You wanna, you wanna stand here and argue why this is a terrible idea for the country? Okay. I'm not a nasty person. We need to talk. Meet your people. But it wasn't just Justin Trudeau who made that promise. It was every liberal who stood under that platform made the promise too. And they've yet to have a vote on it. So let's give them that vote. That's May 31st. Yes? Are there 20 liberals that we should be targeting? Because Ralph is in cabinet. So, yeah, so cabinet's not. So yep. they would. Yeah. So who should I email and say, look, so, I need you to do this? So there's two working lists that we have right now. Because yes, having a member of parliament from your riding in cabinet can be tricky. Even though I would argue that this shouldn't even be a one-line whip vote. 
This is not a confidence motion. This isn't the government standing or falling. Why is this a cabinet? But they're going to interpret it that way. Because cabinet took this decision when they were on their retreat in Calgary. <laughs> uh, there's two lists. There's one list, which is all those MPs that have broken, broken rank. We have that list that we have available. We also have a second list of all the Liberals who signed the pledge from Fair Vote Canada, saying, if I get elected, I will work for PR, proportional representation. I put that list on my Facebook just the other day, a lot on Twitter, and lots of traffic. All these folks are writing, hey, local MP, I just saw you on the list. <laughs> what you doing? And by the way, uh, in terms of inciting reaction, I have never, and it kind of makes sense, but I've never seen a government more reactive to Twitter mentions than this one. It's, you can get, you just put a little handle with their name on it, and it's amazing. I mean, we all like to see our names and hear people talking about us, but this government is very sensitive to social media. Very sensitive. There was a question. You sort of answered it. Is, is, I was going to ask you, will this be a whipped vote? But we can also use it. They use that again, you know, again, one more thing. That this isn't a government. We, we actually did a little historical dig and said, has there ever been a whipped vote on a committee report? There's three whips. You can have a one-line whip, which is the cabinet. Two-line is cabinet plus the called parliamentary secretaries, yeah. kind of their stand-ins. Three-line is everybody. That's budgets. That's confidence. There's never been a whip vote of any kind on a committee report, because it's a committee report. Right? The committee, Trudeau has often said, committees are the masters of their own fate. They must be independent. They must do their job. We did our job. These are the recommendations. If you disagree with them, well, then fine. Present something else. But whipping a vote has never happened in Parliament's history. I mean, they may decide to make history, but that would be weird. Yeah. And it, would put a, it might save a number of my liberal colleagues from the embarrassment of saying, well, I kind of had to. But it would also then say, well, what does it mean to be a liberal member of Parliament? If they're going to whip you on a committee report vote, right. I want you to be my voice, not their voice, right? We, how many times have you heard politicians say that? We need the voice of Regina brought to Ottawa, not Ottawa talking to Regina. Yeah, of course. That's the way the system is designed. Yes, sir. I, I'm not clear. If, if you got 20 liberal MPs, yes. then what would the result be? We would win the vote. And the vote would be? On the recommendations that came from that Electoral Reform Committee. Which would largely that, be referendum. Which would also include referendum. So like, remember what I said, there would be three choices for the government. They could just follow the committee's recommendations to the letter, which would probably surprise me a little bit. They could ignore it entirely, which is also an option, but comes with some damage. Or they could say, all right, all right, all right, we heard. We've got all these liberals from around the country who only won by a bed or won by borrowing votes and all the rest of that stuff. They're feeling the pressure. What can we get done before 2019? Those are, those are the three options that I see. If Parliament declares that proportional representation and referendum and all those other recommendations is the will of Parliament. But that's that's key, I guess. That's proportional right. representation is the recommendation. That, it, it, of the evidence that was presented to the committee, the overwhelming uh, evidence described Canada moving to a proportional representation. Of those seeking change, proportional representation was the overwhelming recommendation that the committee heard. I guess what I've been concerned about is that their compromise <laughs> might be, okay, we'll do it, we'll do a ranked ballot. And I, I don't view that as yeah, effective, right. effective <coughs> Okay, just, just to get good terminology, because it's important, is ranked ballot is, is uh, the way you vote on a ballot. You can actually, in a proportional system, have a ranked ballot. It's kind of, I know I'm being a bit technical. What Trudeau prefers is a thing called alternative vote, which uses first past the post with a ranked ballot. You could use a proportional system with a ranked ballot and actually get okay results. We suggested it to the government. If you're obsessed about the ranked ballot piece of this, okay. But you just have to encompass it in a proportional system, where about 25% of the votes will get you about 25% of the seats. Like that's the first order principle. How you organize the ballot is kind of like a second order thing. Uh, yes? So uh, I wanted to be more specific on, sure, on yeah. your answer, like when you say proportional representation, so were you more specific than that? What we said, because the government said don't give us a system, what we chose then was, I don't well, you know, yeah. uh, what we said then was there's a way to test systems, there's a way to find out how proportional they are, are they very, very proportional or are they less so? So there's, a, there's, a, there's like a mathematical test you can put onto any system and say does it do a good job or does it do a bad job? So that's the committee's recommendation. A proportional system that meets this level of the test. I know it's a bit in the weeds, but 
uh, suffice it to say that any system we had to come up with would have to meet this test. To what extent did you uh, review the Law Reform Commission's three-year study? We did. We brought them in. We brought one of the authors of the Law Reform Commission study. So know this. There's been uh, 14 major national studies in Canada. All of them. Yeah, that one to me made the most sense. The law reform was, was, was amongst the, uh, the I really wondered where the hell you were spending time when it was laid out in front of you with I, well, you law reform. So. And the uh, other thing uh, that I wanted to ask was this whole issue of, uh, of a referendum on it. Yeah. I guess I, I was really concerned, and in, in our report to the committee, uh, you know, we made it pretty clear. We never got there. two minutes in bear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... Uh, as far as I'm concerned, is that basically what that was about, was the Conservatives torpedoing the thing. That's the whole thing. Right. Ah. And by the time they got a chance to spin this issue, like when you went to a coffee shop, they could spin this to the point of where everybody say, I'm throwing up my hands and I want it to remain the same. That was my concern. And yeah. I'm just wondering if you... Oh, I share the concern. Could, we, we wrote a sort of a supplemental report expressing concerns about referendum. Some of the things that I told you tonight, they can be done badly. They tend to maintain the status quo, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, again, though, the, that's why I sort of like confirmation ones, where you've seen it, there's not the fear of the unknown and that kind of thing. Yet, giving the voters the assurance that it won't just be politicians making the decision over our voting system without some voter vote. It's, it's. There's not going to be a. By the way, I didn't say this earlier. There's no such thing as a perfect voting system. Like some people will say, this is the perfect one and it would solve all of our problems. No, there's better and there's worse. What we recommended were better. And within that, you have some choices. There's also no perfect way to confirm a voting system. Some say referendum is the only way. Some people say confirmation. Others say never do a referendum. It's a, it's a challenge. And I admit, it was a struggle for the committee. But I, <laughs> your alternatives are what? Your alternatives are five dissenting reports. Your alternatives are each party staying in their little sandbox and not willing to move a muscle to yeah. come to some agreement. Was I a big fan of referendum? Absolutely not. Because I, you know, testimony like yours I said there's problems with referendum. So yes, I struggled with it. If the government wants to come in and say we think referendum is, we so want to do this, but we worry about referendum, let's find an alternative path. We would find an alternative path, but that is not what they're saying right now. They're saying we don't want to do any referendum or not. They will say referendum is why we are now going to disagree. There's an expression called grasping at straws. It's what a drowning person does. Yes? Sorry, I didn't know if you wanted to speak on the question after the period, but I do want to ask this, a question about there this slide. Okay. Um, so, um, say we call 20 Liberal MPs, yeah. and they decide to stay home. That doesn't win it for us. No. Either 40 stay home or 20 vote with Yeah, us. some folks have got an MP in their riding who's really uh, uh, conflicted about this and has said, well, what if I don't show up that night and I have a cold? And so that's for them and their constituents to decide. Um, but no, the way the math works is that when you get one voting for, it right. kind of counts as right. two. So we need to flip 20, not just convince 20 to stay home. Yeah, and by flip, it's kind of it's an interesting thing because it assumes they agree with what Trudeau did. Right, yeah. Right, which they, we again, guess, right? we have, we have, Op-eds op in the newspaper in writings written by liberal MPs that say I was as disappointed as you. So, yeah. Okay. And sure. Like what? What kind of pressure? I've been dying to know since yeah. this happened. What pressure was put on Trudeau that he would go back on his core values and make this lie? I have no idea. Please. And I've been like, I need. Yeah, I need. I need some journalist to, to tease this out of him or catch them somehow or. <laughs> Or yeah, well, use C fifty one and find it out from him, and then leak it, to, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> well, I mean, again, the ad hominem sort of stuff is not where I tend to go. Um, clearly, there's there's options. Either he made the promise, never believed it, or made the promise and believed it at the time and had a change of heart for some reason. I think that's it. Yeah. Um, or made the promise, hoping that it would be alternative vote, which is has the consequence of being both electoral reform because you are changing the voting system and having a knock-on benefit of being greatly favorable to centrist parties. Um, and once that was gone, once that left the building, then it became options how do we just kill the whole project entirely. Which, it, it had the, if I were to guess, it, it was either we get alternative vote or we get nothing. But we definitely don't want some system. By the way, proportional systems, I haven't said this, for, unless you get 50% plus of the voting public supporting you, you end up in minority and coalition governments. People need to know this. 
Yet we've done research around the world and had it done for us that PR countries are actually more stable, have fewer elections than first past the post countries. And this guy named uh, uh, Leapheart, who's like kind of the guy on this stuff, studied for the last 50 years democracies comparing first past the post versus proportional ones. Proportional countries outperform on economics, social justice, yeah. and climate and environmental policy because. Canada, we think we're super boring as a democracy. We, with 10,000 votes in a country of 35 million people, you can flip majority governments. Right? 39% popular support versus 33% popular support. Boom! That's the majority of nothing. That's amazing, actually. That is a highly fragile system. And we see it. It's called policy lurch. New government comes in and spends a whole bunch of time and money trying to get rid of the policies of the last government. And then another one, and then Successful democracies often have some sort of center beam where you're running down. And so issues like poverty, like climate change, like social justice, which take longer than four years, don't tend to get solved very well in Canada. That's why we have one of the worst performances on climate change, on inequity, on things like affordability. Because if they don't, you just can't make it by the next term, by the next election. And so, this idea that you move to a proportional system and it somehow everything starts swaying. And by the way, when we have had minority governments, not only would I argue individual MPs and the people they represent get more powerful, some of our longest and most sustaining policies have come out of minority parliaments. The, the social safety net, healthcare, the flag, all arrived at when not one party had all the power. And we're watching it in BC right now. What's going to happen? Well, it's going to be a minority. Well, what are you going to do? Well, the parties are now talking. This is a bit unusual for Canadians. This is how most of the Western world works. Yeah. And we saw it in Holland, where an alt-right candidate, peroxide hair, neo-fascist, alt-right, whatever you want to call it. I mean, this guy was serious danger, man. And, and I and it was dangerous. Total, yeah. His party had literally come from the Nazis. <laughs> I'm not. You can't make it up. He was doing quite well. And then they had a general election. And 